the big shows about. He was the like the barker in a circus. You know, the bark in the circus say, step right up, folks, the big show's on the inside. Put your dime in and go inside. He was that way. He was like the circus barker, not just now and then, but constantly. Colonel was a, the shrewdest, most brilliant businessman and con artist I ever met in my entire life. I did not like the Colonel, and I'm sorry what he did to Elvis. And actually, uh, you know, I could, uh, I, I love the guy. I have no dirt to throw at the Colonel. Well, he was a jerk, man, you know. Colonel Parker's sense of humor never stopped. Colonel had a great sense of humor. But when it came to business, it was hardcore business. He was much more interesting man than Elvis was. Uh, I found him absolutely fascinating, and I wouldn't trust him across the room. He had style, he knew it, and he flaunted it. And the Colonel just cashed in, didn't care about Elvis's dream. You had to be there to understand, so I don't care what anybody tells me. I was there, I saw what I, what I saw, and it's, it just was meant to be that way. Give up to my reputation of being a nice guy. This is it, folks. Beautiful, man. Colonel Tom Parker wasn't really a colonel. His first name wasn't really Tom, and his last name wasn't really Parker. Other than that, much of what you've heard about this colorful character is also shrouded in mystery. He never really talked too much about his early years. I never even knew he changed his name until I read it in a book or I saw it in a newspaper someplace. Somebody said, you know, he was Von something. I don't even know the name. I just know it was Colonel Tom Parker. Although he claimed to have been born in Huntington, West Virginia, Andreas Cornelius Van Kujic came into this world on June 26, 1909, in Breda, Holland. When the colonel was a young man, uh, he was always big for his age, he said. I mean, tall. He was six feet tall, although in later years he became a bit stooped. But he was about six feet tall. And uh, when he was a young man in Holland, uh, one of his jobs was carrying big rounds of cheese from the factory onto the barges. When he was 20, Andreas stowed away on board an ocean liner and entered the United States an illegal alien. He immediately joined the U.S. Army and set aside his Dutch heritage to take the name of his commanding officer, Thomas Parker. It all seemed, you know, it all seemed kind of, uh, you know, strange that, you know, that he felt the way he did, that maybe somehow he didn't belong here or you know, that somehow in the end it wasn't, you know, it wasn't totally legal for him to be here. I, I never understood that part of it, but that was part of the colonel. I asked the colonel one time after I was passed away, I said, I didn't ever knew you were a, a non-citizen. He says, well, Joe, I served the serve. I was in the army for two years. He says, and to me, that, I mean, that made me a citizen because I served in the army of the United States Army. And he says, nobody ever asked me. He says, if somebody had asked me if I was a U.S. citizen, I would have said no. After leaving the army in 1932, Parker was hired as a barker with a traveling carnival called the Johnny J. Jones Exposition. It was a job that would have a far-reaching influence on the rest of his life. He was like the barker in a circus. You know, the bark in a circus say, step right up, folks, the big show's on the inside. The big show's about to start. See, Goliath, the most infernal beast. Oh, Colonel loved to talk about the carnival days. Uh, I mean, he, he felt, felt very proud about that. I mean, he was more or less the PR guy for the carnivals that he worked with. And, but he, he did everything. He was a barker. He did the games. Uh, he sold hot dogs. And it's a famous story about the canaries. He um, had these, they get these sparrows, and they would spray them yellow and sell them as canaries. <laughs> canaries were too expensive, but sparrows were free. So they, they, that's what they do. They'd spray them and sell them. Then the dancing chickens, another famous story. They would throw down some chicken feed on this hot plate, and the chickens were, you know, would like, it was hot, and they were dancing around, and they were trying to eat the, the chicken feed at the same time. They'd be jumping all around. <laughs> and those were funny to us. He was a con man. He was a man who wasn't even here legally in this country. He was a man who did a carny show by putting a, uh, um, he had a dancing chicken act, 
He put this chicken on a hot stove and made it jumped around and he called it the dancing chicken. What else can you say? By now, Parker had married Marie Mott Ross, whom he'd met while working with the carnival in Florida. One legend that dogged Parker all his life had to do with a patent medicine of questionable repute, known as Hadacol. We first became aware of Colonel Parker when we were touring uh, Texas. And we looked on the billboards, and throughout Texas, there were these huge signs, drink Hadacol. My uncle, who was an ordained minister, said to my mother, you know, I feel so much better lately because I have started drinking Hadacol, and it really makes me feel great. So we found out later that Hadacol had a high percentage of alcohol. I thought that was funny. <laughs> but oh, uh, uh, Colonel Parker was at my house with his lovely wife, and I says, oh, here we go. I said, I have to tell you, I always think of you as the Haddocall man. And you know something? He didn't really want to hear that. He bristled a bit. After selling Haddocall, I guess he figured he could sell anything, you know. <laughs> well, Colonel Parker had nothing whatsoever to do with Haddocall. He told me many times, he said, Joe, I don't know where they come up with these stories. I know nothing about Haddocall. I never had a bottle in my hand. He had nothing to do with Haddocall. The reason I'm saying that they tried to hire me. He wouldn't let them have me as a performer. By the early 40s, Parker had begun a new career as a manager for up-and-coming singers, another job that would have far-reaching consequences. He managed Gene Austin, country singer, very famous country singer back in the 40s. And then he handled Eddie Arnold, and uh, he managed him. When we'd be in a town and there'd be a circus or whatever the, the, it happened to be, he'd take me and introduce me to these people. I met people that I never thought about meeting with the, that was in the, the circus business because he was an old carny and they help one another. They really do, they help one another and he did. In 1948, the governor of Louisiana bestowed on Parker an honorary military title. Parker immediately announced to his assistant, from now on, see to it that everyone addresses me as the Colonel. In 1953, Eddie Arnold, in a move still shrouded in mystery, sent the Colonel a telegram informing him that his services were no longer required. I don't know how Eddie and Colonel, all I know is that he remained friends till Colonel passed away. Yes, I did the eulogy for him and, and would do it again today. Around this time, a young singer from Tupelo, Mississippi, was just starting to make a name for himself down south. His manager was a young disc jockey named Bob Neal. Bob Neal was still managing Elvis at that time. He was a Memphis disc jockey. And he got Elvis on these shows because Elvis was making some noise in the south. Now, I think Bob knew, though, not to, he couldn't handle him because he didn't know what to do with him. He didn't know where to go with him, and I think he realized Colonel Parker could take him to far better places than he could have. In 1955, the Colonel's assistant, Oscar Davis, informed his boss that this Presley fellow was worth taking a look at. When um, Elvis came along, Colonel was not managing anybody, okay? He more or less had shows. He was putting country shows around, Hank Snow and stuff like that. He was booking shows around the United States. And I, if I'm not mistaken, somebody mentioned to him, I can't think who it was, about I saw this kid this club one time. You got to see this kid. You should book him on one of your shows. So Colonel said, okay, we'll try him out. So he booked him and Colonel didn't even know, didn't even see him. And then he went to the show and he saw the reaction. And Elvis sometimes had to come back for two and three encores because they just wouldn't leave. Finally, at the end of those tours, they put Elvis on last. Well, he, he saw there's something pretty good here and he booked him more and more and then eventually he had to be the closing act because even Hank Snow got mad about that when Elvis had to open the show uh, before and for him, then eventually he was opening the show for Elvis. But he knew that the reaction from the audiences was, was pretty strong. So he, he uh, did his homework, did his research, and found out that Elvis's contract was coming up pretty soon. Now he worked at Elvis to about becoming his manager, and that's basically what happened. By early 1956, the Colonel, who wasn't even Elvis's official manager yet, had succeeded in switching Presley from the relatively obscure Sun Records label to more prestigious RCA, 
and arranged for him to make his national television debut. Uh, last year, in 55, I was, uh, my manager was Bob Neal, who was a disc jockey in Memphis. And we organized uh, at this Presley Enterprises and had an office. But when I signed up with Colonel Tom Parker in Nashville, uh, we figured we needed the office and the horse, so he's handed everything out of Nashville. On the Ides of March, 1956, Colonel Tom Parker signed Elvis Presley as his one and only client, although signed might not be the right word. There was never a contract signed between the two men. It was a conversation, a gentleman's agreement, and a handshake. And throughout all the years that they were together, they both honored that contract. It was more, much more than manager and artist. It was uh, like surrogate father, best, best big brother, uncle, or something to that effect. Colonel Parker actually got pretty close to Elvis. Uh, and so Elvis really went along with almost everything Colonel Parker suggested because Colonel Parker had gotten him to the top, kept Elvis on top. So he more or less uh, followed the direction of Colonel Tom Parker. And they were very good friends in addition to being uh, uh, Colonel Parker being his manager. Having conquered records, radio, and television, for which he received 25% of Elvis's earnings, Parker arranged for Presley to take on Hollywood, once again using his persuasive managerial style to swing an unprecedented deal with the studios. Before Elvis Presley, nobody ever got a piece of a movie. They got a salary, and that was it. Colonel was the only man that started where artists got a piece of the picture. So that changed how a lot of other managers and agents started doing that with other stars. Uh, Colonel was always very tough when it says it comes to money. I, I'm, I'm money up front, because he knows by the end that when he goes through all the bookkeeping in Hollywood, you never get a dime on the, the percentage you got coming. So he always said, I want it up front. That's why Elvis Presley was the first man to get a million dollars a picture, plus a piece of the movie. If I ever saw the Colonel, and I saw a lot of the Colonel in Palm Springs, I would always ask him about something, and he'd say, uh, ma'am, I, you know, I don't know anything about the other side of Elvis's life. You want to talk to me a little bit about the business life? I can tell you everything about the business life, and please know that I have 50% of everything he makes. The deal is outrageous. The deal is outrageous. In fact, it's outrageous back when Elvis is getting 50% of the profits for his movies, because Elvis, of course, is not really getting 50% of the profits for those pictures because of the way his deal is structured with the colonel. The colonel is becoming fabulously wealthy. Colonel Parker never took 50% of Elvis' earnings. Never. The colonel always was bringing him movies in which there was a great deal of music and singing, and I'm quite sure it was all for financial reasons, because it was either publishing that they could own, or there were records that they that they were involved with, that they could make money from, and, uh, and the colonel was always interested on one level from the financial point of view. Well, you know, everybody blames everything on everybody else, but ultimately it's, it's, Elvis, it's Elvis Presley. He makes the decisions. You know, I mean, I'm sure he, he did not make a lot of right decisions in his life either, but he's the one that could have made the change. Nobody else could make the changes. Even Colonel Park couldn't make changes, because if Elvis stood his ground, Colonel had no choice. He should have let Elvis do what Elvis wanted to do, because he, Elvis knew what he wanted to do, and that was to play and sing. He would always let Elvis make the creative decisions. He would present it with opportunities, and Elvis would say yes, or would say no. Do you want to do this movie? Do you, you want to do this script? Do you want to do these songs? All those creative choices were, were Elvis's. Elvis had finished a picture, and I said, what do you do next, Elvis? And he said, I don't know. The Colonel hasn't told me yet. He never interfered with the creative part of Elvis. He said, Elvis, is a star. He knows exactly what he's doing. I'm not going to tell him what to sing or how to dress or how to act. He knows how to do those things. I just do the business part. The Colonel was Elvis. If you wanted to pay respects to Elvis, you paid respects to the Colonel and that was it. The Colonel was that great buffer. If the Colonel approved of you, everything was cool. Oh yeah, there were always people that wanted to meet Elvis, always dignitaries and politicians that wanted to meet Elvis. Uh, Colonel just had a simple answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was, you know, he, he had the, he, 
He played the homespun part. He was so far from that, of course, as we know. He was brilliant. He, he was uh, one of the sharpest uh, con men that I've ever run, run across. <laughs> Every time you'd see Colonel Parker, he'd be reaching in his pocket and sticking things in your pocket. He'd be putting a button on your lapel. I noticed that on one side of the uh, the ground, fairground, it's I like Elvis buttons, and the other side is I hate Elvis buttons. And uh, uh, what do you think of that, Elvis? He said, well, everyone's got an opinion, but did you look at the back? And then, and then one of the guys turned over and said, oh, for crying out loud, Elvis Presley Enterprises, on both of them. <laughs> By the late 60s, Elvis's popularity as a box office draw was slipping causing the studio brass to rethink his contract. Colonel Parker thought for a moment, he said, you know, he said, you're absolutely right. My boy may not be around too much longer, therefore I think we ought to, since this is probably going to be his last film, we ought to double the price. And he got it. He, he said, you started the negotiation, as I understand it, right? Colonel Parker walked out of that meeting uh, uh, getting twice as much as Elvis would have gotten uh, if he'd have stayed just under the normal contract. I, I was there, yes, with some of the deals that the Colonel made. He was a very shrewd bargainer. You know, he, he, was, he, he paid a lot of dues, the Colonel. Came up, you know, in the old Carney days when you really had to be on your toes every second. Men did like Colonel, because yeah, he was a strong individual and he did great business deals and he was very smart. He uh, did a lot of things. And women, Colonel was not real, real warm with women. Yeah, he was not an approachable person. He, um, I didn't care for him, I guess, because he wasn't a, he was just different than everybody else on that, you know, connected with the movie. He was very standoffish. Elvis had a dream, and the Colonel just cashed in. Didn't care about Elvis's dream. Cared about the cash, cared about the Colonel. And if a man's dream dies, then so does the man. I was worried also about the colonel. And he said, oh, my personal life is my own. The colonel just directs my uh, career. And of course, now we see that's not true at all. He was behind everything. He liked to bluff people, see how scared you, you'd be of him. But then when you weren't, then, you know, he said, oh, well, this is one that won't take my love. But once he got to know you, he loved kids. He loved, uh, you know, he was very friendly to all our wives and girlfriends. Once he got to know them, uh, animals, loved animals. So any person that loves animals and kids has got to be, you know, have a good heart. I mean, it's true. And Elvis loved animals and kids, too. But he loved women, too. Colonel Parker played practical jokes, but never to hurt a person. I've never known him to, to do a joke that was harmful to the person. He, he was very sensitive about people's feelings. The colonel was a moon child. They have a great sensitivity. There, there were a number of cases when we're in the office and somebody would call and he would answer the phone, not as Colonel Parker, but as an anonymous assistant. Is this Colonel Parker's office? The colonel says, yes. Who, who is this? Uh, this is Sam Ferguson. Oh, and, and he could hear her in the background talking to her friend saying, I've got Colonel Parker's office on the phone. Sam Ferguson answered the phone. Is, is Elvis there? No, no. But he just left. Hold on and I'll see if I can catch him before he gets to the elevator. And he puts the phone down and we're all sitting there just our, our mouths are open. They picked up the phone and says, Oh, I'm so sorry. I just missed him. But I tried. Try later. Howdy, hi, hi, this is the Colonel. I said, Colonel, it's uh, Red Robinson of Vancouver. Oh, yeah, Red, how are you? I said, Well, Tom Moffat told me to call Elvis in the room. You just missed him. I'll never know, but to this day, I think Elvis was in the room. But I recorded my conversation with the Colonel. You know, I was wondering if it would be possible to talk to Elvis. Maybe not, but he said you're the man to call. Gosh, I wish you'd have called about 10 minutes ago. He just left. Oh, for crying out loud. Uh, just walk out of here. One of the more amusing manifestations of Parker's sense of humor was a rather exclusive club he founded himself. For those that don't know, the Snowman's Club was a fictitious club that the Colonel was president of, or Chief Potentate, I think he called himself. And, uh... It was strictly for anybody who was great at um, knowing how to BS 
uh, you became a member of, the, of Colonel Parker's Snowman's Club. Colonel was the most high potentate of the Snowman's League of America, and our slogan was, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. You've heard of snow jobs. So people that he thought were, were, were good snowmen, he would invite in, and he was the, uh, he was the chief potentate of the <laughs> Snowman's League of America, so there was, there was a long period in there where we didn't even call him colonel, we called him potentate. <laughs> It was so much fun to see new members get their book because they were excited about it. And they would start and they would look at the first part and they would read a few basic rules and then they would come to this section that was all blank pages. He was promoting when he handed you a book with nothing written down on the pages. <laughs> he, he took you, you know? <laughs> when you can read everything on every page, you're a real member. And they, they would, you know, they would give him this look, what is this about? And then he would say, a real snowman reads between the lines. <laughs> in 1967, Elvis married Priscilla in Las Vegas, a city that would have great significance for both Elvis and the Colonel. The Colonel said, come on, nudge me. He said, come on, where was he going? He loved roulette. And roulette was his game. And we went out. He bought about $50,000 worth of chips, which in, at that time, I think was about 1967 it was, and $50,000 was a big buy. And while he was playing, he said, this is the luckiest casino for me. So I always suspected that that's why he selected that one to have the wedding at, because it was a good chance for him to get out. And by the way, he lost the 50000 Although gambling would prove to be a worrisome vice, Parker had no problem avoiding other temptations. I used to drive him sometimes from L.A. to Palm Springs to his home. We'd stop halfway down there. I said, Joe, stop and get a beer. Well, I never did the Colonel ever to drink. So I said, OK. He said, let's split a beer. We'd split a beer. Apparently, he never ever said it. Maybe he was one of those guys when he was young that when he drank, he was a completely different person. I had that feeling about it. So he, he knew that he couldn't drink. And that was the only time I ever saw him have a, anything with alcohol. You know, I don't recall that the Colonel ever drank but he did enjoy a great cigar, and uh, we always had cigars on tour. <laughs> in 1969, Elvis began performing at the International Hotel, signifying the official start of his Vegas years. I first met Colonel Parker in 1969, in the spring of 1969, when he came into Las Vegas um, to sign the contract for the opening at the International Hotel and the hotel wasn't even opened at that time. It was still under construction. The romance bloomed because uh, Colonel and I were kindred spirits. We had a personal relationship before we had a working relationship. At that time, his wife was suffering from um, what they now would call Alzheimer's. Um, she didn't always even know Colonel. His life was, it was a sad life at, at home. You could go to Vegas with him uh, when Elvis was there, and uh, he might stay up all night in the casino or just at the hotel and go get two hours sleep. And the rest of us, who are a lot younger than the Colonel, would just be dragging. And he would be full of pep. When they were filming That's the Way It Is at the International Hotel, the fans from the back had started to move forward, and he was about to be mobbed, and Colonel jumped up ran up, picked up Elvis, and put him on the other side of a barrier. And I sat there, I just, I absolutely could not believe it. He came back, sat down, like nothing had happened, and I said, Colonel, you're back, are you all right? And he said, I had to help him. With Vegas now his center of operations, the Colonel was able to indulge his vice with even more passion than in earlier years. The Colonel liked to gamble. We started, first started playing in Las Vegas. I mean, we didn't know this until we went to Vegas. I mean, so we started playing there. And I'd see him at the roulette wheel. And he'd say, Joe, sit down, play. We'd play some roulette, you know. And, 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 and little by little, I think he got hooked. You know, who's gambling? And when you gamble, if you gamble, you'll sell your mother. I didn't sell my mother for too long. Just two days, I sold my mother. She, she overcame that. Colonel Parker was a tremendous uh, gambler. I mean, he, when Elvis was working at the, the Hilton Hotel, he lost literally millions of dollars. And that's why he booked Elvis in there a lot of times. And I don't think Elvis ever really knew how much money 
that was being taken from him. My manager, Colonel Tom Parker, where is he? Is the Colonel around anywhere? Oh, he's out, you know, he's out playing roulette. Don't kid me, I know what he's doing. Him and Cosby out there talking mash and drinking trash or whatever. Despite Elvis's kidding, there may have been some genuine frustration behind those words. If the Colonel would come in the room, I mean, it was like, you know, anything, you know, whatever you want. And then as the years wore on and as their relationship deteriorated, uh, would be in Vegas seeing Elvis and he would, uh, for spite, sing the songs that the Colonel hated the most just to make the Colonel, you know, upset and the Colonel would be outside gambling Elvis's next paycheck. I, I think the Colonel kind of boxed him in. Elvis, the feeling I had about Elvis is he wanted more of a life and he was having less of a life. I know from many conversations with Elvis that he was adamant about letting go of Colonel Parker, finding a new manager, and he wanted to have a different lifestyle than the one he was uh, leading. They, they were a great match, but like all good matches, uh, there came a time when the Colonel should have eased, and I don't think he did. Colonel Elvis had a big fight one time, and uh, Colonel walked out. He said, I'm through, I'm out of here. It was in Vegas at one time, and he said, you know, you get somebody else. And uh, that went on for about a week, 10 days, and I think the Colonel, you know, Elvis said, we gotta get somebody else to manage me, and let's talk to Tom Hewlett, see if Tom will handle me. Tom was one of the concert promoters. He was Jerry Weintraub's partner on Concerts West. And Elvis liked Tom tremendously, and uh, he wanted, you know, but Elvis even talked to Tom Hewlett about taking Colonel's place, and, and Tom said, you know, you can't, you, you can't do that. Colonel's your best manager, and he knows you, and he's with you, stuck with you all those years, and he's the best guy for you. Some members of Elvis's backup band were treated to the Colonel's special brand of eccentricity. I was down the dressing rooms. There was that long hallway, and the current, we were the only two down there, and the Colonel was walking this way, and I'm walking this way, and he did one of these numbers. Just passed me like this. Didn't even acknowledge I was alive. You know. I thought, God, what did I do? What did I say, you know? So I asked, I think it was Red West, I asked somebody, I said, and I told him what happened. And Red started laughing. He said, oh, he said, they had a meeting last night, and uh, the Colonel found out how much you were making. <laughs> And he told Elvis, he said, boy, I could put chimpanzees on the stage with you and the people still love you. <laughs> and he never said a word to, to, as far as I know, I know he didn't say a word to me for five years. One up and coming singer songwriter got a firsthand taste of the Colonel's peculiar ways. Somebody said, the Colonel wants to meet you. And I said, you're kidding. And I, I said, okay, and I went over there. And uh, he says, uh, he says, you, you the boy that wrote this song? And I said, yes, sir. He said, what's your name? I said, Mac Davis. He says, uh, bend over here and let the colonel rub that curly head of yours. And I said, excuse me? And all the Memphis boys said, hey, you know, let, let him do it. So I did it, and he rubbed my head, and he said, now you can tell everybody that Colonel Parker rubbed your head. You're going to be a star. He was constantly calling me on the telephone and giving me advice at the Golden Nugget and at the Mirage and at Treasure Island and, at, and then he never made it to Bellagio, but at the Mirage. And he always knew what was going on. He once called me up and said, Steve, I want you to take out a pencil. Now you know I don't give you any bad steers. But you know I can spot somebody when they're coming. I said, sure, I know that, Colonel. He said, well, I'm gonna tell you one. Now you mark this down, it's a girl. First name, Celine, C-E-L-I-N-E. -E. Last name, Dion, D-I-O-N, like the singer. Now this girl's from Canada. She's got a voice the size of the Empire State Building. She's gonna be a giant star. You figure out how to make a connection and get this girl to work at the Mirage. I never could quite convince him that I had Siegfried and Roy there, you know, that, that I couldn't just push, push him out or something. Ever the savvy businessman, Parker understood the value of keeping the fans happy. Put your butt in the seat. And what he was saying is, is look at this from the perspective of the fan. What does that fan want? What does that fan expect? That's what I want you guys thinking about, and that's what I want you guys doing. So many times, he would see a fan standing in line and maybe recognize the fan as being a, a 
hardcore, loyal fan, and he would walk them through the line and say to the maitre d', where are you going to put these people? And the maitre d' couldn't <laughs> say anything, but uh, the best seat colonel, colonel would wait and to make sure they got a good seat. So he says, I got an idea. We got 500 sticks left, 400 sticks, and no pennants. So we got the big teddy bear, don't we? I said, yup. He says, have a sign made in Japanese. So we used to have the Japanese, do you know the story? The Japanese bear, the Japanese Elvis junkets. Elvis special teddy bear Pearl Harbor Day special. Bear toothpicks. Get all the pennant sticks sharpened, <laughs> which I did. Sell them for 25 cents a piece. We sold all the pennant sticks in one day. <laughs> I don't know how politically correct that is, but it sure as hell was funny. <laughs> yeah, I remember Colonel Parker uh, uh, starting you know, selling programs, uh, pictures, hats, uh, different things of Elvis at the concerts. Well, a lot of other groups, managers were saying, oh, how could he do that? So tacky and all that. And all of a sudden, they realize there's a lot of money in that situation. And all of a sudden, everybody, every country you go to now, you got t-shirts, sweatshirts, I mean, the, the programs, everything you can think of. And the prices are big. You know, a t-shirt you can buy for a dollar, they're selling it for 20 bucks. Elvis's talent and the Colonel's promotional magic succeeded in conquering Vegas. But how to bring that powerhouse combo to the rest of America? T.C. Ryder, what you have done. There is this... Uh, manager named Jerry Weintraub who lived in New York that had this desire to promote Elvis Presley and he he it took him several years he kept hounding Colonel Parker I used to call every morning good morning Colonel it's Jerry Weintraub yeah. I want to take Elvis on tour and every morning he said to me what are you, you're crazy. Why, why do you keep calling here? You're wasting your money. This went on for one year. And finally, one morning, he said to me, uh, I called him, and he said to me, you still want to take my boy on tour? I said, yes. He said, okay, you be in Vegas tomorrow at 11 o'clock with a million dollars and we'll talk. And I hung up and I said to my wife, you see, I told you I was gonna get Elvis Presley. And she said, well, you got one little obstacle here. <laughs> you know, you owe the bank $65,000 as it is. <laughs> you know, where are you gonna get a million dollars? There was a gentleman named Steve Weiss that knew Concert West and also knew Jerry Weintraub. And he was the one that put Jerry Weintraub together with Concert West. And again, we had the two elements he didn't have. We had the experience and we had the money. I spoke to the guy and I said, can you please send me the million dollars right away? He said, well, what am I gonna get for it? And I said, I'll give you half of the money I make in the concert business for ever. My boss, Lester Smith, and I went to the U.S. National Bank in Portland, Oregon, and and uh, got the uh, used our line of credit uh, to to wire the funds to uh, to Las Vegas. About an hour later, I now called the colonel and and pushed the my meeting to two o'clock. He said, "I'll give it till two. I said, "I just need it's on the way. The money is on the way. I just need a little longer." And he said, "He said, okay, I'll give it till two. So. Uh, the money came in, and this fellow came out from the back, the president. He said, come, can you come to my office? I went into his office, and he said to me, there's a check here for you for a million dollars made out to Elvis Presley. I can't believe this. I said, well, I said, that's what I'm waiting for. Like, can I have it? So he said, yes, yes. Well, he said, what are you going to do with this? I said, I'm going to take Elvis Presley on tour. I'm going to do a tour. And he said to me, can you use an accountant? I'd like to leave here and go with you. So I got the money, went to the International Hotel, got, a, got Tom Parker, 
And I said, and I found that he, he couldn't miss him. He, he, you know, he, was, he was sitting with his cigar and his cane and his hat on, and he, was, he had more chips on the table than anybody else. And I said, I'm ready, I have, I have the million dollars. So I knew at that moment in, in time, and I was only a young boy, you know, I was in my 20s, I knew that my life had changed, that my life was never going to be the same. Because I, was now, I now was going to be in business with the biggest star that it had ever been. The only thing Elvis Presley ever cared about, to have his fans in the first 20 rows. He said, don't put those big shots in the front. <laughs> put them in the back. After they had been doing the concert tour, and Jerry had gone from being penniless to being a wealthy guy, he met the Colonel out west. And, the, sh and the, the tour had been going on for about six months or five months. And Jerry had a million dollars in the bank after for his part. And the colonel had two briefcases. He opened them up, and they were filled with money. Money, jammed with money. One's mine, and Elvis's, the other one's yours. Which one do you want? Jerry says, but Colonel, I I've already been treated generously on the concert tour. Uh, the tour operator doesn't usually have anything to do with the, with the sales of the novels. He says, partner's a partner, Jerry. Which one do you want? He says, you decide. The colonel took his cane and hit one of them, closed the other one. He says, that's yours. Jerry Weintraub says that's the single greatest moment of his life. Elvis, 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 live. You know, Bloomington, Indiana, uh, live. Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. It was like... It was the strangest thing, he didn't, you know, it was just a, a guy pressing really hard. And he bought, he bought spots all the way across the board so everybody in town knew about it. He was the guy who really sort of invented the, uh, the, the way of putting shows on sale now where you put everything out front or you put a big punch out front so people know it goes on, when it's going on sale. Colonel was totally dynamic. Uh, Colonel didn't stop thinking. He was 24-7 for Elvis. He was a perfectionist. He was uh, a man that expected a lot of things from you, uh, but he was also a very, very fair man. Somewhere in the mid-70s, when Elvis came back on another road tour, uh, I went to uh, Seattle again to see him. He never came back to Vancouver. And uh, while I was there, there's a you know, warm-up act, and then there's an intermission. And I looked down, and who's out there selling programs? Who's out there hawking stuff on the front of the stage but Colonel Parker? So I go down and I talk to him. He said, how are you doing, Randy? I said, I'll be very happy if you buy something. <laughs> he, was, he was always trying to get me to do something for him for free. Uh, he said, if you do my biography, he said, you're going to make a lot of money. This is going to be a, an automatic bestseller. He said, immediately going to be a bestseller. I said, how do you know that? He said, because I'm going to sell advertising in the book. I said, what? He said, yeah, the book is going to, he said, I've already sold the back cover to RCA, and he says, I'll sell the front, the, the front cover to Paramount Pictures. He said, so the book is paid for immediately, so every dime that comes in now is pure profit. Uh, and he said, uh, and I also, he said, I've got, a, uh, I've got a title for it. I said, what's the title? He said, it's, the title is, uh, how much does it cost if it's for free? I said, pretty good title. <laughs> And I said, uh, I think let's talk about making a movie out of your life. He says, all right, we'll do that. I said, and I got the ideal guy to play, the, play your part. He said, who's that? I said, W.C. Fields. He said, thank you very much, and never mentioned the subject again to me. <laughs> the Colonel was very generous. We always got a tour bonus at the end of the tour. And even if we didn't work on that tour, didn't do much or whatever, we always got a bonus at the end of every tour. He was the lowest guy for, to the, the top guys. He made sure that... Uh, Everybody was taken care of. Well, he was a jerk, man. You know, he never let Elvis go out of the country. I mean, you don't want to talk about people, deceased people, but, you know, he couldn't go with Elvis to England. He couldn't go with Elvis out of the United States because he didn't have a visa. He was, he was here illegally. And uh, he, that's why Elvis Preston never went out of the United States. As far as Elvis touring in Europe, a lot of people have, you know, have said something about, you know, that, that uh, Colonel didn't want to go uh, because he was an illegal alien and everything like that. Well, if they would just understand, Colonel had some very, very powerful people in government. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the senator from Texas, 
was a close friend of Colonel Parker's. Lyndon Baines Johnson, when he became president, whatever, could have taken care of that illegal alien thing, and there would have been no paper trail of any kind. Colonel said, there's no stadium big enough for Elvis to play there indoors. His idea, which was toward the end of Elvis, you know, before Elvis passed away, there was talk about them going over there and doing one stadium, but do it for 30 days, stay in England. And he figures there would be people from all over Europe would fly in to see Elvis there, uh, uh, see the show there. So there was talk about that. And, and he also said, Joe, he says, I didn't have to go with him. Tom Hewitt and all those guys, I didn't have to go. If I was worried about leaving the country, I would have sent them over. I think Parker, uh, he's, it, 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 he really had a tremendous concern at the beginning about Elvis. But I think later on it just became a piece of meat. You had to be there to understand the whole situation. It was a very unusual situation. We were in Louisville, Kentucky, a few months before Elvis passed away. And Elvis had a very, very difficult night. But nothing would stop him from performing. That night in his room, he had a fever, he was nauseous, he couldn't sleep, he felt like he was gonna pass out. The next afternoon, it was about four o'clock, his doctor was in the bedroom with him trying to revive Elvis because he took some sleeping pills and he couldn't wake up. And I was waiting in the suite, in the, in, in the, in, in the front room of the suite, I was watching television. There was a pounding on the front door, which startled me because no one is allowed on our floor. We have a lot of security policemen out there. I ran to the door and I looked through the peephole and it was Colonel Parker, which was unusual because he usually never came to Elvis's room, ever. I opened the door, I said, Colonel, and he said, where is he? I said, well, he's in his bedroom. Let me tell him you're here. He said, no, I'm going to go right in. He walked right by me, opened the door, and I saw the doctor dunking Elvis's head into a bucket of ice water. Elvis was in bed, bending over like this. He was semi-conscious. And then the door closed. My very first thought was, perfect, good. Good. And now Colonel Parker is going to see Elvis in the shape that he's in. He's, the reality of what's going on here in terms of Elvis's health is going to hit him. These tours are going to stop like they should. Approximately a minute and a half later, Colonel Parker walks up to me. And we stand toe to toe to one another. He holds his cane up and he says, now you listen to me. The only thing that's important is that that man is on the stage tonight. Do you hear me? Nothing else matters, nothing. And he walked out. We were touring and he came back to the room one night and he was crying. He said, I've lost him. My friend is gone. It was because he went to have a meeting with Elvis, and Elvis couldn't be roused for the meeting. <sighs> we all have weaknesses. We all have families. And Colonel understood those in Elvis. He tried every way he could to help Elvis overcome it, but it was not possible. I would want the fans to know that he cared about Elvis always. I'm sure it was very frustrating to the Colonel too, at times, you know, seeing what was happening to Elvis and uh, not looking as well as he should, not take care of himself. And uh, uh, he tried, he tried. And uh, people don't give Colonel Parker credit for that, but uh, Colonel never talked to anybody about that. What Colonel and Elvis talked about was between the two of them. I will get into a controversy here about Colonel Parker, who was not one of my favorite people. I thought he was the epitome of a bad manager. I did not like the Colonel, and I'm sorry what he did to Elvis. On August 16, 1977, the Colonel's only client died at the age of 42, the victim of his own excesses. Parker, like everyone else, was devastated by the news, but rebounded in the days and weeks following Elvis's passing. Well, I mean, the whole world changed for a lot of people. Colonel Parker, too, when Elvis passed away. Um, you know, he just, uh, 
I think he figured Elvis was his one and only big star and he'll never match another one ever again. I mean, a lot of people came to him to ask if he would handle them and no, he didn't. He wouldn't do it. But he gave advice to a lot of people. You know, I mean, there was a lot of stars and different celebrities that became friends with the Colonel and he'd give them advice, you know, and there was no, he didn't want to manage anybody and, and uh, he was good about that. But I mean, Colonel, ever, you know, he talked about Elvis as being around actually after he passed away, you know, we got to make sure Elvis is taken care of, make sure do positive things about him. And uh, uh, I don't think um, he really discussed him leaving too much after he left. Colonel, I said, you okay? He said, no, no, really, this is, I have an idea. He said, you know, he says, now, have you ever watched CBN? I said, sure. He says, well, you, you, you see, that's a big thing, you know. That, you would be great on CBN. And I said, Colonel, are you asking me to become Reverend Tony Orlando? Is that something? Am I hearing this correctly? <laughs> he said, you got it, precisely. I went, case is closed, lunch is over, you need a doctor, out of here. I had to leave. He said, no, 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 really, I could see it. We'll open a church, you'll be, I said, I said, Colonel, he said, we will sell more Bibles. Now, Tony's story is a great story. And I could see the colonel doing that, but he wouldn't have managed him. This was advice he was giving Tony, what he sees Tony, because Tony's a great speaker. And on stage, he's up, practically pe preaching up there anyhow. So, I mean, I could see him uh, doing that. Uh, but, you know, Colonel, that's, that's an idea he had in his head, saying this would be good for you, but he would never manage him. No, never happened. You know, I have a lot of fond memories of Colonel Parker. He was, he, he, he was very uh, interested in... In, in me as an individual and concerned and, uh, you know, so he is somebody I really cared for and, 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 uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, I, could, I, I love the guy. He yeah. played Santa Claus for the children at the Christmas parties. Um, many times we would be eating in the restaurant and he'd see an old couple eating a very meager meal and he would call the waitress over and say, tell those people I'd like to buy their dinner. Maybe they could order a little more. He, he's always doing things like that. He gave, um, he gave hundreds and thousands of dollars to charities, always with the stipulation, no publicity. I guess the most poignant story that I can talk about to do with, you know, the sensitive side of the colonel is about two years before he died, and you have to understand that at that time it was very difficult for the colonel to walk and everything. He calls me up one day and he says, come on, Kenny, we're going to the circus. He says, I got great seats. And he went down this 150 or so odd steps at great, great deal of pain and suffering to himself to get to our seats and watch this whole thing. And then coming back up, I, I thought he was going to collapse. I mean, his face was filled with beads of sweat. And he just did that out of his concern and his caring for my kids. My brother became very close to Colonel Parker and stayed that way, as you know, until his death. Kenny was one of the guys that did a eulogy for Tom when he died. A lot of times I think he felt misunderstood, particularly, you know, in the later years when he would see some of these things that were written about him, uh, things that were uh, written about his relationship with Elvis and, you know, the, the way the business of Elvis was handled. Well, I'll put it this way. If Colonel Parker heard all those stories about, you know, about Colonel screwing Elvis on this and make bad decisions as far as career goes, he never mentioned it to me. I, I could see the Colonel hearing about it, but never do anything about it. He just, he just let it go because he knew he'd been around the business long enough. They're going to say something about you no matter what, if it's good or bad. or They're always going to talk about it. He can't, let, he can't let that bother you. Colonel was always hurt by the way the tabloids talked about him. In his later years, he, he was around with the guys around the casinos, and we'd, we'd sit and have coffee and just talk. He, he was, uh, he, at the end, he seemed very lonely and despondent. The colonel once told me, he said, uh, you know, I, I mean, he, he was thankful that he lived as long as he did. And, uh, and he did say one thing, though. He said, if it wasn't for Luann, my wife Luann, he said, I would never last this long, because she really took care of him real well. And uh, she inspired him and kept him happy and always took care of him well. And I think uh, he really felt great about that. And, and uh, I mean, uh, I miss the Colonel, too. I mean, he was a character, uh, one of the smartest people in the world, nice human being. People don't realize it, very considerate, uh, 
that he loved people, and he always, you know, I, I wish people could really have met him instead of what they read about him. On January 21st, 1997, Andreas Cornelius Van Kuyik, alias Colonel Thomas Andrew Parker, died of a stroke. He was 87 years of age and had outlived his legendary client by two decades. I don't think you'll have a, a partnership like Colonel Parker and Elvis ever again. The world's changed. It's totally different. I mean, they uh, uh, artists today, they burn through managers about every two weeks. That was a special association. You know, they changed the world, and normal people can't do that. You had to be there to understand. Elvis was not easy to handle, and Colonel Parker was the only man that could have handled it. Another manager could have handled him, but it would not have done as good a job as Colonel Parker did. But I'm not saying, like I said before, Colonel made a lot of mistakes too. But overall, nobody could have handled Elvis Presley better than Colonel Parker. Elvis was Elvis in capital letters with an exclamation point because of Colonel Parker. He had, obviously, the great talent, but the Colonel made it happen, and he made it happen the right way, and he made it happen big. And it, it was because of the Colonel. I mean, some of the people that I see that manage artists today if they were managing Elvis Presley, Elvis Presley wouldn't have been Elvis. It was like they were meant to be. Uh, it was just Elvis and the Colonel. And it's, uh, I just can't see anything else happening. I can see another manager with Elvis. I'd like to live up to my reputation of being a nice guy. This is it, folks. <laughs> now, you want more about him? We'll talk about more about him some other time, after the, after the cameras are shut down.